Chris, it's been so nice. I don't know how you keep it up, Chris. I really don't. It's so nice all week. He's the kind of man you could say to Chris, I'm really sorry. I, I've crashed your car and um, it gets worse. I, I crashed into your house. Your house has caught fire. And, and what's more, your wife has just run off with your best friend. And, and you know that Chris would say, thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing. That's really interesting. <laughs> thank you for taking me to a place that I didn't know existed. Thank you. <laughs> One of the... Thank you for inviting us. One of the things about appearing late on in the TED week is that uh, gradually as the days go by, uh, all the other speakers cover most of what you were going to say. Um, <laughs> nuclear fusion, I had about 10 minutes on that. Uh, spectroscopy, that was another one. Um, parallel universe. Uh, uh, so th this morning I thought, oh, well, I'll just do a card trick. Um, that one's gone as well. So, uh, and today is Emmanuel's day. I think we've agreed that already, haven't we? Emmanuel, he took it. absolutely. Yeah. I was planning on finishing on a dance, so that's going to look pretty shabby now. Um, so, what I thought I'd do is, uh, in honour of Emmanuel, is uh, what I can do is to launch today the first TED Global Auction. Uh, if I could start, this is the Enigma decoding machine. <laughs> Who'll start me with a thousand dollars? Anyone? Thank you. This is Bruno's face just then. He said, no, don't go through this. Don't, please, don't, don't go through this. Don't, don't, don't do it. Um, <laughs> I'm worried. When I first got the invitation, they said somewhere in the thing, they said, 15 minutes to change the world. Your moment on stage, 15 minutes to change the world. I don't know about you, it takes me 15 minutes to change a plug. <laughs> so the idea of changing the world is, is really quite an extraordinary one. Uh, although, of course, now we don't, we don't have to change a plug. Now we've seen that wonderful demonstration of the wireless electric. Fantastic, you know, and it inspires us. You know, 300 years ago, he'd have been burnt at the stake for that. <laughs> and now it's an idea. But it's great. It's fantastic. But you do meet some fantastic people and uh, people who look at the world in a totally different way. Uh, yesterday, David Deutsch, another one who covered most of what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> But when you think of the world in that way, it does, it does make going to Starbucks a whole new experience, don't you think? I mean, he must walk in and, and they will say, would you like a macchiato or a latte or an Americano or a cappuccino? And he'll say, you're offering me things that are infinitely variable. <laughs> How can your coffee be true? <laughs> and they will say, would you mind if I serve the next customer? <laughs> And Elaine Morgan yesterday, wasn't she wonderful? Fantastic, really good. Her talk about the, the aquatic ape and the link, of course, the link between, between Darwinism and the fact that we are all uh, naked uh, beneath this, well, not her suit, and we can swim rather well. And she said, you know, she's 90, she's running out of time, she said, and she's desperate to find more evidence for the link. And I think, I'm sitting next to Lewis Pugh. <laughs> this man has swum around the North Pole. What more evidence do you want? <laughs> and there he is. That's how Ted brings these connections together. I wasn't here on Tuesday. I didn't actually see Gordon Brown's job application. Um, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Uh... Global problems require Scottish solutions. Uh... <laughs> the problem I have is because Gordon Brown, he comes on stage and you know, he, he looks for all the world like a man who's just taken the head off a bear suit. Hello, can I tell you what happened in the woods back there? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've only got 18 minutes. 18 minutes to talk about uh, sa saving the world, sa saving uh, the planet, global institutions, uh, our work on climate change. I've, I've only got 18 minutes, unfortunately. I, I, I'm not able to tell you about all the wonderful things we're doing uh, to promote the climate change agenda I in Great Britain, uh, like the, the, the third runway we're planning at Heathrow Airport. <laughs> the, the large coal-fired power station we're building at, at, at King's North. And, of course, the, the exciting news that only today, only this week, uh, Britain's only manufacturer of wind turbines has been forced, forced to close. No time, unfortunately, to, 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 to mention those. Uh, British jobs for Scottish people. No. Uh, 
Christian principles, Christian values, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. <laughs> Although, to be honest, when I was at number 11, that was never going to be a problem. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, all right, come on. Uh, uh, all right, Gordon, come on. Uh, I just, can I just say a few things about, you know, firstly about Cherie, you know, because she's a wonderful lady, you know. Uh, and my wife with a, with a wonderful smile. Uh, that reminds me, I must post that letter. Um, I, just, I just think, you know, what, what people forget, you know, Gordon and I, we always got on perfectly well. Eh? All right, it's never exactly Brokeback Mountain, but... <laughs> you know, I wrote to him just before I left office. I said, you know, can I rely on your support for the next, for the next month? And he wrote back, he said, uh, no, you can't. Uh, which kind of surprised me, because I'd never seen can't spelt that way before, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. Another thing Gordon, of course, could have mentioned in his speech to the Mansion House uh, in 2002, uh, that was the, the building, the people weren't listening, but the, the people went talking about the finance industry. He said, what you as a city of London have done for financial services, we as a government hope to do for the economy as a whole. <laughs> when you think what's happened to financial services and you see what's happened to the economy, you think, well, there's a man who delivers on his promises. But we're in a new world now. We're in a completely new world. This is the first time that I can remember where if you get a letter from the bank manager about a loan, you don't know if you're borrowing money from him or he's borrowing money from you. <laughs> Am I right? These extraordinary things. Icelandic internet accounts. Did anyone here have an Icelandic internet account? I mean, why would you do that? Why? Would, it's like one step up from replying to one of those emails from Nigeria, isn't it? <laughs> Asking for all your bank details. And, you know, Iceland, it was never going to cut it. It didn't have that kind of, of collateral. What does it have? It has fish. That's all. That's why the Prime Minister went on television. He said, this has left us all with a very big haddock. <laughs> a lot of what I do, I have to try and make sense of things before I can make nonsense of them. And making sense of the financial crisis is very, very difficult. Uh, luckily, somebody like George Bush was really helpful. He summed it up, really, in, uh, in, in a dinner. He was speaking at a dinner. He said, uh, Wall Street got drunk. And now it's got a hangover. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's something, you know, that's, that's something we can, we, we, we can relate to. It's certainly something he can relate to. Anyway. Uh, and the other one, of course, is, is Donald Rumsfeld, who said, you know, we have the, the, there are the known knowns, the things we know we know. Uh, and then you got the known unknowns, the things we know we don't know. And then you got the unknown unknown. So those are the things we don't know, we don't know. And, uh, you know, being English, when I first heard that, I thought, what a lot of cock. And then, you now, you realize, well, actually, you know, that's what this is about. This whole, what Ben Bernanke has said, the chaotic unwinding of the world's financial system. It's, it's about, they, they, don't, they don't know. They didn't know what they were doing. In 2006, the American, the head of the American Mortgage Bankers Association said, quote, as we can clearly see, no seismic occurrence is about to overwhelm the US economy. Now, there's a man on top of his job. <laughs> and when the crisis was happening, the head of quantitative equities at Lehman Brothers said, events which models predict predicted would happen once every 10,000 years happened every day for three days. So it's extraordinary. It's a new world. It's very, very difficult to make sense of. Um, but we have, we have new hope. We have uh, a new man. America has now elected its, its first openly black president. Wonderful news. Not only that, he's left-handed, have you noticed this? How many people here left-handed? You see, I've known a lot of the people that I most admire, they're, they're, they're great artists, great designers, great thinkers, they're left-handed. And somebody said to me last night, yeah, being left-handed, you have to learn to write without smudging the ink. And somebody was talking about metaphors on Monday, and I thought, what a wonderful metaphor, isn't it? An American president who has to write without smudging the ink. You like that one? As opposed to, you can see George Bush, where, well, what, what's the metaphor there? I think it would be something out of the aquatic ape thing, wouldn't it? Well, you know, I'm sorry about that. I'm right-handed, but I seem to have smudged that ink as well. <laughs> but, you know, he's gone. Now he's gone. That's eight years of American history, eight minutes of my act, just gone like that. You know, it's the end of an error. I happen to believe it was a great error. <laughs> I know folks said to me they believe it was one of the greatest errors in the history of the United States. <laughs> but we proved them wrong in Iraq. They said there was no link between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. There is now.
But I have a message for the suicide bombers, for those people who have, uh, who have blown themselves up. <laughs> We're going to find you. <laughs> We're going to make sure you don't do it again. <laughs> But now he's gone. It's great to see one of the, the arguably one of the worst speech makers in American history. Now given way to one of the greatest in Obama. You were there maybe on the night of his victory and he spoke to the crowd in Chicago. He said, if there is anyone out there who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible. I can't do the whole thing because it would take too long, it really would. But <laughs> you get the picture. And then it goes to the inauguration and he and the Chief Justice, they trip over each other, they get the words wrong and they screw the thing up. And there's George Bush sitting there going, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Not so easy, is it? <laughs> but the interesting thing is, Gordon Brown was talking about, yeah, about Cicero who said, great spell, people would listen to a speech, and they'd say, great speech, and then they'd listen to Demosthenes and they'd say, let's march. And the great thing, we all want to believe in, in President Obama. It's uh, rather like uh, that line in the film, As Good As It Gets. Do you remember that film with Helen Hunt and Jack Nicholson? And Helen Hunt says to Jack Nicholson, what do you, what do you see in me? And, and Jack Nicholson just says, you make me want to be a better man. And you want a leader who inspires and challenges and makes you want to be a better citizen, right? But at the moment, uh, it's, it's the Cicero thing. We like what Barack Obama says, but we don't do anything about it. So he comes over to this country and he says, we need a big fiscal stimulus. And everyone goes, great. He leaves the country and the French and the Germans go, no, no, forget about that. <laughs> Absolutely not. Nothing happens. He goes to Strasbourg. He says, we need more boots on the ground in Afghanistan. And everyone goes, great idea. He leaves. People go, no, 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 we're not going to do that. 5,000 maximum and no rockets. No, no, we're not going to do that. He goes to Prague. He says, we believe in a nuclear free world. And it's great to have an American president who can say the word nuclear. Let's just point that out first. <laughs> Remember that, George? Uh, a nuclear. Sorry, a, a nuclear. A nu could you say? Could you say a vuncular? A vuncular. <laughs> Thank you very much. But he says we want a nuclear-free world. And that day, North Korea. That very day, North Korea is just seeing if it can just get one over Japan and <laughs> land it before. So where do we look for inspiration? We still got Bill Clinton, who travels the world. <laughs> I believe, I believe it was President Dwight D. Eisenhower who said, tell a lie it was Diana Ross, <laughs> who said, who said, reach out and touch somebody's hand, make this world a better place if you can. I just think that's important. I really do. <laughs> And I was hoping Hillary would get to the White House because she'd have been out of our home for four years. And I, I, you know, so when that didn't work out, I had to unpick a few arrangements, let me tell you. But <laughs> so there's him in Britain. We have Prince Charles and, and the environment. I mean, it's so important, all we can do. I mean, I, my, my wife gets fed up with me constantly trying to push emissions up her agenda. But, um, <laughs> you know, we so much. Or any South Africans, we have, we have Mandela to inspire, um, Man, great, the great man Mandela. Uh, the, he's been honoured with a statue now. The previous uh, highest honour he had in Britain was a visit from the team from Ground Force, a gardening programme. So, Nelson, how would you like a nice water feature? Ah, oh, listen to me, Mr. Titmarsh. <laughs> I, I was held in prison for nearly 30 years on an island in the middle of the ocean. Why would I need a bloody water feature? <laughs> Very quickly, uh, I wasn't quite sure how to end this uh, talk. And then yesterday, uh, that man came up with a wonderful quote from the Japanese essays on idleness, which said, it's nice to have something which is unfinished because it implies there's still room for growth. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>